morning, church. It's great to see you all here with us on this beautiful morning. Why don't you stand and worship with us? happen and not just in the bible times but in today 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 he is creating miracles and we're going to sing a new song we just ask that as you feel comfortable to join in to the praising
Oh 
resurrected King.
His presence out loud in your minds. Just thank Him for what He's done. be reminded to praise you through the good times, through the bad times. There is no one like you, nor will there ever be. Jesus, just thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to worship you freely. And our brothers and sisters across the way may think it too. to worship with you guys. Go ahead and say hi to somebody and we're gonna get started. Good morning. Everybody's got a lot of energy today. That was good worship, wasn't it? Amen. Just uh, love seeing uh, people use their gifts and talents and, and serve the Lord. And uh, just a reminder, if you've got gifts and talents that you'd like to use here at the church, let us know. We'd love to, love to plug you in. And, uh, you know, we always need help in, in multiple different areas, ushering, greeting, children's ministries, technology is really a big one that we could use some help with here at the church. So if you are 
good in that area, let myself or Pastor Jeremy know. He is the man behind the wall this morning. So uh, that's where you see him. So all of our service production stuff, you don't know that. We have a whole room set up back here. Uh, you know, we're working with the cameras and everything going online and, and all of our PowerPoint and things like that. And so uh, any of that stuff that, that you like uh, to do, let us know. We'd love to... Uh, Love to plug you in. Well, good morning. My name is Brad Keen. I'm the lead pastor here. And if you are a guest, thank you for uh, being here with this morning. We're glad that you came and uh, worshiped with us on this uh, beautiful morning. I just want to welcome everybody watching online as well uh, this morning. All right, got a few announcements that I want to go through. First of all, uh, reminder, we have a Red Cross uh, blood drive coming up here on June 22nd. Uh, this is something that we started doing a couple of years ago, and we meet all the way down the other end of the building. And so you can go on the Red Cross's website, and uh, you can sign up for a slot. That's June 22nd. It goes from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, so come and donate some blood, and uh, it, it can help save a life. And uh, just a, a great thing to do. And uh, if you're scared of needles, just look the other way. Then you don't have to worry about it. Um, but uh, it's a life-saving thing, so we'd love to, love to have you uh, join us for that. Uh, also, tonight, there is a uh, small group that is meeting. Pastor Jeremy Alicia's small group is meeting in the youth building. Uh, so come through the parking lot all the way around back. Go in the building over there. So they meet tonight at 6.30. They always have some uh, snack foods and some things to go with that as well. So I uh, want to invite you to that. And then our movie night and food truck night on June 4th, Friday, June 4th. We're going to be watching the movie Up. Uh, Frank's Fries and Corn Dogs and, and all the things they have are going to be here. And then uh, we're also going to have barbecue again, Big C's Barbecue. So I want to invite you to come out. Uh, you know, let your family and friends know about it. We're going to meet out here in the parking lot, and we've got a big, giant, inflatable screen. I forget, 16, 18 feet, something like that we bought last year. And so that's going to be out here on that night. And so we just want to have that be a great time uh, of fellowship with our church body, and then also anyone else that wants to come. Again, invite family and friends uh, out to that. It's going to be a great time. And, and then another good way to support our small businesses as well. And, and uh, so we want to be a blessing to them. So it starts at 6 Come on out at 6, have dinner with the family, and then we're going to try to start the movie in the 7.30 range uh, based upon lighting and, and, uh, and things like that. We want to be able to see the movie, but yet we want to be able to done, be done by you know, a, a decent time as well so people aren't leaving here incredibly late. So come on out for a movie night on uh, June 4th. All right, this Wednesday, 7 o'clock, Point Man uh, is meeting. Our family night is taking our summer break. Uh, now for the next, next couple of months, but Point Man will continue meeting uh, through summer camp in July. So uh, come on out. If you are a teenager, come on out for that. Also this morning, speaking of summer breaks, we had our last life group uh, for the school year, and we will now take a couple months off of our Sunday school life groups at 9.30 on uh, Sunday morning. So we're going to be taking a break for them. So if you come next Sunday at 9.30, uh, I guess just come find me. You can pray with me before service because uh, you'll be here early uh, by yourself. So uh, life groups are taking a break as well. All right, this time we're going to take up our tithes and our offerings. And so if you are here, we have baskets uh, in the back. You can uh, drop your uh, tithe off there. Otherwise, if you are uh, online, you can go to www.cgs.church. You can text 84321. Or you can download the Church Center app and you can give that, uh, give that way as well. But all those are very, very uh, easy ways to do that. So when we give our tithes, we give our offerings, we give our first 10% back to God. We say, God, we honor you. We acknowledge that you are the source uh, of everything that I have. And, uh, you know, money's a big area in our life, isn't it? And we talked about that uh, a few weeks ago in our, in our guardrail series. And, you know, when we honor God just in that area of our life, it's amazing to see how things fall in line. And, and I talked to many people during that series and, and especially during that week that just said, I don't know how it works, but I've always tithed. Or once I started tithing, it always worked out and, and uh, God always made a way. And so when we give our tithes and offerings, uh, we're really giving him back to what he's given us. We're giving it back to God and giving him our first fruits. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. Uh, let's pray. Let's go before our Heavenly Father. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this opportunity to give back to you what you have so freely and graciously given to us. Uh, God, it takes money to survive in this world, and God, we ask that you'd help us to not see, you know, the sweat from our own brow, the, the work from our own hands, from our, our, our jobs as, 
as our provision for our needs, God, you've blessed us with those things. God, we ask that you'd always help us to see you as the source, you as the provider of what we have. And so now as we give our tithes or offerings back to you, um, God, we pray that you'd bless them, that you'd bless those that are giving. God, we pray that you would use these resources to further your kingdom. Father God, to reach people in this region and around the world for your purpose and for your glory. And, it's in, and, and Lord, we pray too for, uh, for all those that, that might be ill this morning, those that are, that are healing up from surgeries, those that are at home that are sick. Uh, God, all of those that are just dealing with allergies this time of year with all the pollen in the air. And uh, God, just pray that you'd heal people, that you'd restore people. And uh, Lord, we ask now that you'd open our eyes, you'd open our ears to receive all that you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> all right, well, this morning we are going to take a, a look at Scripture. We're going to dive into God's Word, and we're going to see uh, what it takes and what it looks like to honor God no matter what. And, uh, you know, we wrapped up our guardrail series a couple of weeks ago. Last week we had uh, our prayer service, our healing service, and uh, just a, a great time we had with that. And uh, just a, a lot of prayer needs that were brought up to God, just a lot of great ministry uh, that happened. And, but with that guardrail series, there's a couple of scriptures that I, that I came across in the book of Daniel in, in chapter 1. While I was doing that series and through my studying, that's one of the, the fun things when you're studying and, and you're teaching on topics or uh, you're teaching on a book of the Bible. Sometimes you take little rabbit trails and things in your study and you come across some other verses and, and something kind of strikes you. And so today's message uh, kind of was, was birthed out of study time from that guardrail series and, and just something that for the last couple of weeks I just couldn't really, you know, get out of my head and kind of kept meditating on it and thinking about it. And, and uh, so we're going we're gonna to take a look at uh, this topic this morning of honoring God no matter what. It really came out of my study time uh, during that series. And we're going to take a look at a story from the life of Daniel this morning. It's not Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den. I know that's a fun one. Uh, that's often the story that people think of uh, when they think about the life of, of Daniel. Uh, but Daniel had many, many great stories. He had many uh, amazing encounters with God. He had, he had many uh, God experiences in his life. And so there's lots of great stories about Daniel in Scripture. He really is a pretty amazing hero of the Bible and someone for us to study and learn from and, and grow from. And he, great, he faced great trials and, and uh, persecution and challenges in his life, just like we do, and, and, and incredibly more uh, as far as some trials that, than we probably face, trials of life and, and death. But he was a man of principle. Daniel was a man of godly conviction, and uh, he chose that no matter what was happening, he chose that no matter the consequences, that he was going to honor God with his life, that he was going to worship God, that he was going to pray to his God. No matter the laws, the decrees, the things that happened, God, Daniel was going to honor God with his life, with his actions, with his speech, no matter what. And, you know, really the, the topic that we're looking at today, and just even from the life of Daniel, you could almost build an entire series off of it and, and take multiple weeks uh, to look at this. But this morning, we're just going to look at Daniel chapter 1. We're going to we're going we're gonna to see that, that Daniel was this man of God, a man, a man that honored God no matter what, uh, including when the stakes were incredibly high in his life, including when it came down to a matter of life and death, and death literally hung in the balance. Daniel is an incredible example to us, including, uh, you know, the time that we're living in right now as, as a people here on earth and, and in, the, in the nation that we're living in. How can we as God's people honor God no matter what with our life? You know, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the news and the, and the different things that are happening and some of the, the different laws that are being proposed in Washington and things like that, but, you know, Christians today are living in a time of increasing persecution. And, uh, you know, it, it may not be the same persecution as 
many of our brothers and sisters around the world are, where they're, you know, really facing life and death persecution. Uh, but we're facing persecution in the form of loss of uh, religious liberty, uh, in, in Christian values really being discriminated against, and, and proposed laws to, to, to move against those things. And so we are living in a time of increasing persecution ourselves, and we're living in a time where uh, biblical values are not only not valued or, or upheld in our culture, but we're living in a time where people that hold to traditional Judeo-Christian beliefs, standing on the Word of God and what God's Word has to say about lifestyle and living uh, for God, that these traditional beliefs are, we're being accused of being uh, archaic or hateful or outdated or unloving or being intolerant. Um, it always amazes me how that those that are tolerant um, think that we're intolerant and being intolerant of our beliefs, but that's a whole other topic. We won't go there. Uh, but, you know, all of these things just for believing in and standing on God's Word and what God's Word has to say as far as the standard of living. And so uh, we are called to honor God no matter what with our lives. You know, on an international stage with all the things that have been going on in the last couple of weeks uh, with Israel. And, you know, praise God for the Iron, door, iron Dome, uh, you know, that they have over there. You know, uh, God gives us these ideas, amen. And I don't think for, uh, it's just a coincidence that Israel has this Iron Dome. I mean, that was, you know, an idea, obviously, that, that man had, but God gave, you know, for them to be protected, uh, as well, otherwise they'd be obliterated with all the, the missiles and, and rockets and things being launched at them. But, you know, I never thought I'd see the day where we'd have uh, elected members of, Cong of Congress in support of terrorism and standing against Israel and their right to defend themselves uh, during terrorist attacks. And yet here we we live in a time like that. But I truly believe that a lot of that's a spiritual attack because of who Israel is and what Israel stands for. And so, you know, church, we need to, stay, we need to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world um, in Israel, in other countries, because there are a lot of people that are facing uh, persecution. You know, we have a lot of first world problems in the church. Uh, you know, here in America, people get upset because they don't like the music <clears throat> or the pastor talks too long. Or he doesn't wear the right things, you know, or they changed the style of the church bulletin, or we just got rid of them during COVID altogether. But, you know, I mean, I was just thinking about that this week. All the things that cause division in the American church, where people just pick up their ball and go home because they don't like the way things are, because it's not how they want it. And uh, I wasn't going to go here today. But that's, that's uh, you know, that's where we're at oftentimes in the American church today. It's like, what tickles my ears? What makes me feel good? Or they're not singing the songs that I like, or they're singing songs I don't like, or they're talking about this, or they're going here, or doing that, or, you know, it just, uh, we get caught up in so many things that are really trivial matters. And, and, and there's arguing and infighting and, and, and you got different denominations breaking off from other denominations for the 45th time. And, you know, we get all the, and, and this is really a first world problem in the church. And, you know, I've done missions all around the world. And I don't see that when I go to foreign countries. Because they're there to learn about God's word. They're there to grow. They're there to reach their area, their tribe, uh, their region for the sake of the gospel. Because they understand that life and death, not only here on earth, but eternally hangs in the balance. And we can get caught up, as, as Liz was, was praying and, and closing out service this morning, I, I heard her say something about how, how we just take so many things for granted in this country, and we really do, where if we're not careful, uh, we can just become consumers. We can become consumers in the church, where it's like, what makes me comfortable? Does this make me feel good? If it doesn't, then I'm going to go somewhere else. Well, guess what? We don't serve a God of condemnation. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, but there is spiritual conviction. And sometimes it's good to come to church and go, ouch, that hurt, Lord. I got an area I need to work on. And thank you for ministering to my spirit and showing me that uh, this morning. And, and uh, so we're going to take a look at this area 
uh, this morning about how to honor God uh, no matter what, because our nation and our world just continues to move further and further away from God. And uh, I want to make sure that we as individuals, that we as a church, uh, you know, that we stay away from as many of those first world problems as we can, that we are a church that is in unity for the Great Commission and reaching this region and really the world, especially through our, our missions partners and stuff, that we're reaching the world for Christ. Amen. And, uh, you know, we can have differences of opinions with different things. Uh, you know, it's a great time to talk about this because I don't know of any major problems in the church. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, but that we, because we can, we can disagree on things. The church, and that's something that, that the church in the, in the United States needs to learn. We don't have to agree on everything and we can still be in unity. Okay? I mean, we don't have to agree on everything. We can have differences of, of opinion, but that doesn't mean that we have to get mad at someone. That doesn't mean we have to get upset at someone. That doesn't mean we have to talk bad about another person or a church or the pastor or whatever. Um, you know, we can, we can still have unity and be about the kingdom of God and not agree with every little area, okay? And uh, the same thing within style of church or how you're doing, uh, doing things. But we need to believe in the core tenets of our faith, that Jesus is the son of God, that he died, he rose again, he was born of a virgin, that he's coming back again. And, and, uh, and if we do that as a church on the earth today, uh, we can do great things because I believe that there's going to be a great work of God on the earth today. You know, the pendulum has shifted so far in the wrong direction right now. You know, I'm just waiting for a move of God you know, sweep across the country, amen, and uh, just, you know, today's Pentecost Sunday, just a, a new mighty wind of the Spirit to, to blow across uh, this, this land and this world. But church, we need to honor God no matter what, because it doesn't matter what the world thinks about us, it doesn't matter what the world thinks about what the Bible has to say, because God's word is true. What we need to understand and what we need to be focused on and worried about is what God thinks about us, what God thinks about our life, what God thinks about you know, what we are doing in service to him. And if we're honoring him with our life, no matter what, because God's ways are higher than our ways. And we're not always going to understand the ways of God and the things of God and the ways of God and the lifestyle that God has called his people to is always going to look foolish to the world. It's always going to look foolish because they don't understand. If you don't know Jesus, a life of service, a life of sacrifice, a life of putting others before yourself makes no sense, especially in a nation where we're all about ourselves, about having the American dream, about having everything we could possibly have to make ourselves happy. And God's plan, his desire for your life is not to make you happy. <clears throat> Now, God loves you, and just as I, as a parent, love it when my children are happy, I love it when my kids are happy, I love it when their life is going good, and it breaks my heart when their life isn't going good, my soul, and this is the only way I can really understand it as, as a human being, my whole purpose for existing with my children, though, is not their personal happiness. Right? Every child, though, thinks that, they just need to be happy. And a lot of times we as adults think, well, I just need to be happy. Well, the joy of the Lord is our strength. There's a big difference between joy and happiness. Right. Completely different things. Life can be going bad and we can still have the joy of the Lord. And uh, so joy and happiness are two totally different things. We're not always going to be happy in life. We're not always going to be happy serving God. And, and our happiness is not God's goal and agenda each and every day. Again, there's nothing wrong with being happy. God loves it when we're happy, just like I love it when my kids are happy. Uh, but that's not always going to be the case. We're not always going to be happy. Our kids aren't always going to be happy. What we need to be focused on is living our life rightly before Heavenly Father and honoring Him. Amen? See, God's plan for our life, his trajectory for our life is probably uh, not going to look like the trajectory or the path that we had planned to take. We don't pray and ask God to take his plan and will for our life and make it fit into our plan. Our goal as his people, as his children, is to pray that our plan and our will for our life would get in line with his plans. Amen. 
for our life. It's not the other way around. You know, that, that's a big part of prayer sometimes, saying, God, you know, help me in my heart. Help me in uh, my direction. Help me to want to do your will. Show me your will and your plan for my life. Not going, God, this is what I want you to do. Hurry up, get in line, you know, get on board with this because I got a great idea, God, for my life. And anyone ever prayed those prayers before? I got two hands up. You know, I've prayed those prayers. He's like, come on, God, I got this great idea and let's go do this thing. God's going, wait a second. Wait a second, what about the plans that I have for you? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans, plans to prosper you and, and not to harm you. Plans for good and not for evil. God has great plans for our life. He truly does. And, and I believe he, he enjoys it when we're, when we're happy. But living our life for God is not going to be a utopian state of happiness. It's just not. So we have to understand that as God's children. But we are called to honor God with our life. That's what we're called to do. The way that God does things does, doesn't always add up to man's uh, ideas of logic and planning and reasoning. And I've seen that over and over again uh, with God. I've seen that over and over again in my own life uh, with God. You know, I was thinking about, just thinking back on, on all of our years of pastoral ministry uh, this, this last week and just thinking about Daniel's life and, and, and just thinking about my life and areas and times where we've been, been challenged even though we've, I've never faced, you know, the thing. I've never been in a, in a lion's den or, I've, you know, I've never, never been taken captive, which is a little precursor to the story that we're going to, we're going to see today. But, you know, I was just thinking back over our 23 uh, years of, of ministry in, in May. May 11th was a big day for us. We celebrated our 23rd year of full-time pastoral uh, ministry, which it's hard to believe because I'm only 33 that uh, <clears throat> I've been doing this for 23 years now. Uh, but, you know, I was thinking back to when we first started in, in ministry in, in, in May of 1998, and, uh, and then when we left that position about three years later and, and went and took a, another position that we really felt like God was calling us to, and it was right when our first uh, child, when Autumn, uh, was just getting ready to be born, and God called us to make a big move across the country about four hours away, and I remember grabbing a, a, a piece of notebook paper and drew a line down the middle and had two columns, reasons to go and reasons not to go. And uh, so I wrote, I had this like whole list. I mean, I even flipped it over to the other side of all the reasons not to go. And I had a lot of really good reasons. And, uh, and then on the reasons to go, it said, God said so. <clears throat> that was the only reason I could come up with. And, uh, you know, and so we made this crazy decision because we knew that it was God and, and we made a, a change in our, in our employment from a ministry standpoint and, and we did it, but it was just kind of, again, it was 23 years ago and, and, and it was crazy, but from a logical standpoint, from a human standpoint, it made no sense. We didn't have health insurance for a few months and, and just having a baby and, and uh, just all kinds of reasons to not do something, had a, had a great ministry and, and, and people that we loved. But God said to do it. And when God wants to do something with our lives, I've learned the best thing to do is to do it, you know, and uh, to not fight with him on that. All right. Uh, remember back a couple weeks ago when we were in our guardrail series and we were going through that, uh, we talked about the need for the barriers for our life. We talked about, you know, one of the reasons is for protection. One of the reasons it will, it will help us uh, to prevent regrets as we go through life. And uh, one of the reasons that we need to establish uh, guardrails and establish our limits and boundaries is really, as I thought about that, just even in the, in the last couple of weeks, is, is part of that underlying reasoning that we didn't really talk about in there is to honor God with our life. Um, not just so that we don't have regrets, not just so that we have healthy boundaries, but the underlying principle in all of that is so that we could honor God with our life as we, as we live for him. And that's really where this whole idea of this sermon uh, has, has come from because that was really uh, an underlying theme as I looked back at that because we are called 
to honor God with our life and to glorify God with our life. That's our purpose for living, uh, is to glorify God with our life and in doing so uh, to honor him. And everything that we do and everything that we say and how we act, uh, we should always be, fact, be, should always be conscious of the fact that we need to honor God. We are called to glorify with God with our life. And oftentimes, <clears throat> we're going to have to make difficult uh, decisions, and we're going to face difficult circumstances in our life if we truly choose to honor God with our life. As Christians, we need to draw lines that not only keep us out of trouble and keep us from life's regrets, but we need to have these boundaries in place so that we can honor God with our life no matter what. So if you have your Bible, turn to Daniel chapter 1, uh, pull out your phones, whatever you want to do. Otherwise, the verses will be on uh, the screen behind me, and if we don't get going, we're never going to get out of this, and it'll end up being a part two here. But Daniel is a great example of a man that didn't compromise. And I think that we're really going to be encouraged by uh, his story this morning. And uh, I think it's so encouraging because the story that we're going to read here is one where it would have been really easy for Daniel to justify compromise. Has anyone ever had a problem with justifying compromise in your life? I mean, I do. I think that's one of the temptations of living life and sometimes why we fall into sin because sometimes some compromises are so small, you're like, ah, it's no big deal. And, and it's so easy to just fall into something. And so with Daniel, it was the kind of compromise that wouldn't seem like a big deal. And so these are the kind of compromises that we're faced with on a daily basis. You know, it's not always some big giant compromise where we go, oh no, I can't do that. I know I'm going to, I'm going to sin. Sometimes the sins that we fall into are small things and it kind of snowballs on us. And so we need to understand that. So Daniel chapter 1, we're going to start in uh, verse 1. <clears throat> and we got a lot of fun names uh, in here today. It says, During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. You know, look, look, at, that, look at that verse again. That, that, that kind of messes with our Western theology a little bit. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So God allowed this to happen. You know, sometimes we don't always understand why God allows some things to happen, but God in his wisdom and, and understanding, he, he sees the big picture and, uh, and he does. It says, so Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Asphanes, his chief of staff, to bring him to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only the strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they're well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years and then would enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four young men chosen. Anybody having any babies? There's some good names for you. <clears throat> I have heard Hananiah, but I haven't heard Mishael or Az Azariah. Uh, all were from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. You may recognize those names if you've studied your Bible or been a Christian for any length of time. Those three names are associated with what event in the Bible? The fiery furnace, right? The fiery furnace. And uh, after reading, I want to go like teach on that topic now as well. Uh, you know, just another great, that's why I said this could become a series here about honoring God uh, with your life. So I make no promises whether that will or won't happen. Uh, but, you know, these are guys that were godly men and they honored God uh, with their life. You know, this is the kind of company that, that Daniel kept. You know, you end up, Daniel ends up in the lion's den because of prayer, and his three buddies end up in a fiery furnace because they refuse to, to uh, pray to the king and pray only to their God. Uh, it's kind of important, the friends that we keep. 
And, uh, you know, so these are, the, these are the quality guys that have been taken captive. Verse 8, but Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief, chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I am afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I am afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test this for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed with Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who'd been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any manner requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the, of the reign of King Sirius. You know, this is a neat story. This is a God story. And again, there's so many cool stories uh, from Daniel's life. But let me give you a little history. Let me give you a little background of what's happening. This happens about 605 uh, B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar. He marches into Jerusalem. He, he, uh, he destroys the temple and, and carries off the finest, the brightest uh, young men uh, of the Israelite boys, and he marches them back hundreds of miles uh, to Babylon. Yet, here's the important point, God was in all of that. Okay, King Nebuchadnezzar comes in, he comes into Jerusalem, he destroys the temple, he captures these young Israelite boys, he marches them back to Babylon, and yet God was in the middle of that. God didn't abandon Daniel, God was there for him, and God needed Daniel to be in the positions that he was going to be into, be into later in life. You know, that idea might blow your mind a little bit uh, that God's hand was in this, but God's hand was in this in the middle of, David's cap or of Daniel's captivity. I'm sure Daniel's plans for his life never began with the idea of being taken captive and serving a foreign king. I can almost guarantee with 100% certainty Daniel didn't lay in his bed at night going, God, I hope your plans for my life as I'm taken captive someday. Marched a long ways away from home. I'm sure if Daniel had any say in it, he'd have said, God, that's a terrible plan. You know, sometimes we just, sometimes we want God to reveal his plans for our life. As much as we do, we probably don't. <laughs> We're like, God, that's a bad idea. That is not what I want to do at all. But God has good plans for our life, even if they're not our plans for our life. And I'm sure Daniel, if he had a chance, could have said, God, you got it all wrong. I have some better plans. Come, come over here on this side of, of some ideas that I have for my life. I mean, nowadays, you know, in our country, we don't like anybody telling us what to do, let alone being taken captive and being forced to do certain things. We don't, we don't even like our bosses telling us what to do, and they're giving us a paycheck. You know, as kids, sometimes we don't like our parents or our teachers or our coaches telling us, you know, what to do. An attitude like that uh, in this time literally could cost someone their head. You know, as we just read, the attendant was worried about losing his head uh, by not doing what uh, the king had asked him to do with Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But although these guys are taken captive, verse 5 shows us 
that these guys are going to be well taken care of. They're going to be not lacking or wanting in anything. And the king has plans to use them in his royal service. You know, God does not abandon Daniel in his captivity, yet God's hand is in it, and God cares deeply for Daniel and makes sure that his needs are met. Look with me at verse 5 again. It says, the king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. I want to, this is the, the, the big part of uh, this story that we're going to really look at. This is the, the culmination and the turning point of this whole story. And, and, and this whole sermon's built really upon this verse right here. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years and then they would enter the royal service. Now, during this time of training that the king had planned for them, they would be trained for this period of three years. They would be taught the languages and uh, the language and the literatures of Babylon. They would then serve the king, and they would be given the king's choice food and wine to drink. Now, it doesn't look that bad on the outside, does it? I mean, on the surface level, that sounds like a pretty good gig. That sounds... Like, not a bad plan. If you're going to be taken captive, you're going to be given good lodging, you're going to eat the best food, you're going to drink, you know, the, the best wine in the land. This doesn't sound like that bad of a deal. But Daniel has discernment from God. Daniel is smart. and Daniel could see what was going to happen if they did the things that the king wanted them to do. He and the other young men, again, these are the, these are the healthiest, the fittest, uh, the, the, the best-looking young men in Israel there, they were going to be asked to make a series of compromises. And compromises that didn't look that big uh, on the surface. They were small, seemingly insignificant, little steps, little compromises that if they continued to do them would lead them on a path that would cause them potentially to abandon their religious beliefs and their religious heritage. And none of these things that were, were very significant in and of themselves, but the end place that these small compromises would lead them was all wrong. Daniel recognized what can be so easy for us to miss in our lives, and that's why I wanted to look at this. It's this, this idea that making compromises, making even small compromises, don't erase the tension that we have in living our life for God. Just because we make one compromise doesn't mean that it's going to be easy to honor God in another area of our life. All it does when we don't honor God, when we blow through our guardrails in our life, if you want to go back to there, all it does is it, make it, it makes it easier to do that the next time. It makes it easier to not honor God. Well, I didn't honor God in this area. Next thing, you, you know, it's a little bit bigger area. And, you know, before you know it, you hear about people that have kind of turn their back on God and falling away and they don't look any different uh, than the world around them. It's because it doesn't start with a big decision all at once. It starts with small areas of compromise. See, the king had a plan. The king had an agenda and he was trying to create a bond of dependence with these guys. He was trying to create a bond of gratitude, of loyalty to himself. By giving them the best food and the best wine, trying to, to remove the loyalty that these guys had towards their God of being loyal to him. Because when someone does something nice to us that, you know, you hear about people, you know, buying someone's love or, you know, buying their respect. You know, they give gifts. Why? Because a lot of times people feel like they get loyalty from that. Well, if I do this for this person, they're going to be loyal to me in return. And that's really what the king was trying to do. Now look at verse 8 as well. So Daniel understands this. It says, Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Daniel has, had made up his mind. He had decided he was not going to compromise no matter what. He was not willing to cross this line that just had to do with what he was eating and what he was drinking. You know, Daniel... Uh, the customs, uh, the Jewish customs and things of that time were, were, were very, very important. And he didn't know how the food was prepared, but he definitely knew that it wasn't going to be prepared according to Jewish law and Jewish standards. The food was unclean by Jewish standards. And oftentimes the Babylonians uh, used meats that were considered unclean, meat like pork. And sometimes even the wine would have been dedicated to Babylonian gods. And then this would have been the wine that they were drinking. 
Daniel also didn't want the Babylonians taking credit for his success, for his three years of training. You know, Daniel knew that it was because of God that he'd be successful. He didn't want the king or anyone else taking the credit for the success that he knew that God would give him for living for him and honoring God with his life. And Daniel's resolve to honor God was something that he was willing to take great risks over in making this request. I mean, this is a request that could have turned out very, very badly for Daniel and for these three other guys. But he was not willing to make this compromise, even though this compromise looked like a very, very small thing. After all, he was just asked to eat some of the best food in the land and drink some of the best wine in the land. Honestly, how easy would it have been to compromise if you're Daniel? I mean, of all the things where you go, well, I don't want to get the king mad at me. You know, I kind of like my head on my shoulders here. Of all the areas, well, I can just compromise in this area. I'll make a stand somewhere down the road. I don't need to make a stand here. This would have been, I don't know about you, this would have been an easy area. This is me to compromise in. You're like, I'll stand up for my belief somewhere else down the road. I mean, after all, this is the best food in the land and the best wine in the land. I mean, many of us would have like signed up for that deal, let alone been easy for us to compromise. But God works on Daniel's behalf because Daniel chooses to honor God no matter what. And God gives him favor with this attendant. And, and God gives Daniel this idea of this 10-day trial diet of water and vegetables. You know, I'm not sure that I could do this diet. <clears throat> Maybe if it was just for 10 days, but not for three years. I mean, I love a good salad, but I like meat. I actually went one day this last week where I had had like, you know, I don't know, I had something for breakfast that was healthy and I had a salad for lunch and I don't remember what I had for dinner, but I went to bed that night and I said, I don't think I had any meat today. And then I was suddenly hungry because I didn't have any meat. <clears throat> but I actually went a whole day without any meat, I think, which, I mean, I probably count those on one hand. I love, I love meat. Uh, but Daniel found this compromise here that would allow him to find favor with the attendant that would allow the attendant to hopefully keep his head attached to his shoulders at this time uh, because if the diet failed, you know, then, uh, then, then this attendant wasn't going to lose his head over it. So they have this 10-day trial that, that's put in place. At the end of the 10 days, these guys look good. You know, I don't know how it goes for you guys. I'm 45 years old. Uh, my metabolism's not the same it was when I was 20 and 25 and when I get done with a 10-day diet, you could still take the before pictures. You know, you see people standing there, you know, their picture. <laughs> At the end of 10 days, you can still take the before pictures for me. It's not even hardly kicked in yet. But these guys look good enough within, within 10 days that the attendant says, okay, we're going we're gonna to keep going. We're going to keep going on this. Look at verse 15. It says, at the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who'd been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and the wine that were provided for others. See, Daniel doesn't compromise in an area that looks small, even though it's just the food, even though it's just the wine. It would have been one of those areas of compromise that would have had that snowball effect that we've probably all experienced so many times in our life. You make one small area compromise, it moves to another, it moves to something bigger. And so we have to decide that we're going to honor God no matter what and not make these kinds of compromises in our life. Daniel honored God and God favored Daniel with excellent, excellent results because Daniel chose to honor God no matter what. And in the process, this attendant felt honored because Daniel didn't just, you know, Say, I'm not doing that. I'm not eating this stuff. I mean, sometimes we can be dead right and be dead wrong. That would have been a bad approach for Daniel as well. Just tell the attendant, I'm not doing that stuff. You know, just quit eating a starvation diet. I don't know. But Daniel didn't do that either. Sometimes, sometimes we know how to do things and then we do it the wrong way. You know, Daniel didn't do that. He honored this person that was in a position of authority over him because that guy was then accountable to the king. 
And Daniel could have caused a lot of problems for that guy as well. But Daniel didn't do that in not only not compromising and honoring God, he honored the person that was in position over him so that guy could also honor the king and not lose his life in the process. There's, there's something there that, I wasn't gonna, that is sticking out to me right now as, as we're preaching on this. I don't have time to, to, to dig into that. But there's that aspect as we honor God, we also got to honor people around us as well. And you can not compromise and you can honor God and be respectful to people that are around you. And, and so you see that here. You see this honor that, that Daniel lived his life with. He just didn't go on a starvation diet. He didn't just say, I'm not eating anything. You bring me this because this is what Jewish custom says. If I'm going to serve the king, you're going to do it my way because I honor God. You ever met a Christian like that? Man, I'm stepping on toes. Even my own this morning. We need to honor God. And in honoring God and not making compromises, we can honor people that are around us as well. And we can do things the right way. And so Daniel does this. And so he is granted favor then. He doesn't just bully and push his way through. Sometimes we can be a bulldozer and say, it's my way or no way because I'm honoring God. Well, that's not always Christ-like as well. I'm sure there's times that we need to do that. But Daniel honored the person that was in authority over him, which allowed this man to keep his head attached to his shoulders. It's not about doing what we want in life and at, 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 other, people's expense, at other people's expense. We can honor God and we can do both. And we see that here in this example. Daniel does make a stand. Daniel decides that he's not going to compromise in something that seems so little, a compromise that would have been easy for Daniel, incredibly easy. Instead, he decides to honor God. He honors the king and he honors this attendant because he goes about it in the right way. He has tact as he goes through it. Verse 17, God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. You know, these guys were living in an incredibly... Uh, pagan culture. It was a threatening culture for them. But they honored God in the process. And in the process of honoring God, these guys learned new skills. These guys developed new abilities. Uh, they added to their, to their talents and the ability levels of their life. And then God began to give Daniel this ability to interpret uh, visions and dreams. They studied uh, things like science and literature and language. They had some of the best training. Again, it was not their choice. I'm sure, again, their choice for their life was not to be taken captive. But they honored God and they honored those in positions of authority over their life in the middle of being taken captive, in the middle of being removed from their homeland. They honored God. They found, sa they found favor in the eyes of man and of God because they uh, decided to honor God with their life no matter what. You know, sometimes when life doesn't go the way that we want it, we just pout. We just get mad. We get upset. We're in a job that we don't like. A career that we don't want. Well, maybe God can teach us something in that area for a period of time before he has something different for us. But we have to be willing to honor God in that time and place of honor our boss that we may not like. Maybe our, our boss is, you know, actually just a complete jerk. Well, maybe God's trying to teach you something. Amen? There's a few amens out there. There's a few people going. <laughs> trying to think about it. Honor God in that, in that small area, really, and see if God won't bless you with something else down the road. Honor God in that area. Maybe he'll advance you in your career. All right, we have to wrap this up. God blesses then Daniel with the ability to interpret these visions and these dreams. And really, it's a gift that God gives Daniel that's going to be life-altering as he goes forward. And God's going to use this in his service for, you know, the next 70 plus years. And not only Daniel, but God, God uses all of these men because they chose to honor God with their life. All right, 1920, we're going to, this is the last verses. 
So as the king talked with them, and no one oppressed them as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magi magicians and enchanters of the entire kingdom. Ten times more valuable. How would you like to be ten times more valuable than anyone else in your job? Daniel and these guys were in a bad position. A position that was not of their own making or choosing or liking, and yet they found a way to honor God. They found a way to honor those that were in authority over them, and then God used them for his purpose. God used them for his glory. These guys went on to have incredibly important positions in the kingdom, positions of power, responsibility, authority. They were giving, given many, many opportunities. But here's the thing. They had to continue to make the decision and make the choice to honor God with their life no matter what. It wasn't a one and done. And it wasn't an easy situation that they were put into. But they chose to honor God with their life no matter what. May we as God's people choose to honor God with our life no matter what. Whether it's in our conduct, in our speech, if it's in our job, if it's just in our daily life, it's, if it's a, 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 a compromise that's put in front of us that might seem small, might even seem good. I mean, some good food and good wine, I mean, that'd be easy compromise. Whatever that thing is for you in your life, choose to honor God no matter what. Amen. Let's stand and let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you. We're so thankful for the challenges that we have in Scripture, God, that we can look to men and women of faith, the great heroes of the Bible, and, and look at their stories and, and look at things that they did, God, that, would, that helps us to, to in, this, in this case, Lord, learn how to honor you, Lord, to have the resolve to do what's right no matter what. God, I pray for our church body, for all those that are watching online. God, that you just give us the ability, as you gave Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Father God, that you'd, 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 you'd give us the ability and help us to honor you. God, that your Holy Spirit would just convict us if we begin to make compromises in our life that are not honoring to you. God, may we live for you. May we live for doing your work above all other things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great week. And uh, don't forget about the movie on June 4th. So invite people out to that. It's going to be a great time. And we want to make sure our food truck vendors, their time uh, and the food they buy is worth it for them as well. God bless you. Have a great week.